What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to an audiobook that I am super duper excited to read. This is B7. Now, from an outside perspective, uh, you probably are thinking, what the hell is the title B7? I was thinking the same thing, but this story is insane. It is, it, I would go as far as to say it's more extreme than under construction. I think that's debatable. This is one of my favorite stories, okay? I'm just putting it out there. This is so good, and I haven't even read the actual thing yet. So hopefully there's going to be even added emotion and pain and torture. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I am super duper excited to read through this. I have been waiting for so long. Let's get into B7. Sitting on the blue braided rug, cross-legged with his back against the big grey sofa in his family's living room, Billy snatched an oatmeal cookie from the plate his mum had set on the low coffee table in front of him. He took a bite and looked eagerly across the room to the TV. It's almost time, he shouted, spewing cookie crumbs over his skinny bare legs. Don't talk with your mouth full, Billy's father said. Billy grinned up at his dad. Sorry, he said, spraying more crumbs. He giggled when he realised what he'd done. His dad shook his head and ruffled Billy's hair. Then Billy's dad took a seat on the sofa next to Billy's mum. He picked up the newspaper and opened it wide. The paper crackled and Billy's dad cleared his throat like he always did when he started to read the paper. Outside, the neighbour's dog barked. That meant it was getting dark. The dog always barked when it started to get dark. Billy liked these always things. He was only five years old, but he'd already learned that the place could be a scary place, that the world could be a scary place. When he was three, he got really sick, and he had to have loads of awful needles stuck in his back, and he had to be away from his parents. It was terrifying, and he never knew when something like that would happen again. Always things felt like they had bad surprises away. They, they kept bad surprises away, I'm sorry. When always things happened, Billy could tell himself everything was okay. Billy's mum reached out and turned on the big blue lamp sitting on the end table next to her. The lamp filled the room with yellowish light. She nudged Billy's dad. You know, if you set a better example, Billy's mum said, he wouldn't do that. Hmm, Billy's dad said. He always said hmm if you talked to him while reading the paper. Billy wasn't sure what his mum meant by a better example, but he didn't care much. All he cared about right now was that Freddy and Friends was about to start. Like father, like son, Billy's mum went on. Out of the corner of his eye, Billy saw his mum elbow his dad. You always talk with your mouth full at dinner when you get revved up about work, Billy's mum said. You two are like peas in a pod. Billy did not know what that meant. His mum had said that a lot of times, most recently on Billy's fifth birthday. You look and act more and more like your father every year, his mum had said to Billy the morning of his birthday. She'd been helping him get dressed, and she'd been looking over his head into the full-length mirror on the back of his bedroom door. You're like two peas in a pod. Gazing at his reflection, Billy had seen what his mum meant, sort of, with brown hair that never wanted to lay down quite right, small brown eyes, a round nose and cheeks, and a wide mouth. Billy did look like a shrunk-down version of his dad. He didn't look at all like his pretty blonde mum. He just looked like his dad. He didn't really think he acted like his dad, though. His dad wasn't home that much. He went to an office and worked all the time. And when he was home, he was usually either reading the paper, watching sports on TV, or sleeping. Billy did a lot more stuff than his dad did. He thought the only thing they had in common was TV, and they watched different stuff. For instance, his dad never wanted to watch Freddy and Friends. Billy gazed at the TV, and when the Fazbear Entertainment logo filled the screen, he bounced up and down on his butt. It's starting, he squealed. We were switching to the game in 15 minutes, Billy's dad said. Billy's mum picked up a magazine and started flipping through it. Oh, good grief, Dan, she said. Let him watch his show. You can miss 15 minutes of your precious game. Billy's dad said something in response. But Billy didn't hear Dad's words. Billy was too busy watching Freddy, Chica and Bonnie eat pizza and talk about the camera on the wall above them. Who do you think is watching us? A cartoon Bonnie on the TV said. I don't know, Bonnie, cartoon Freddy said. 
Let's go if we can find whoever it is, Cartoon Chica said. On the TV screen, Bonnie jumped up and grabbed his guitar. Not until we play another song, he said. Okay, Freddy said. He pulled out a mic and started singing. Billy watched, fascinated. Billy liked all of the animatronics, but Freddy was his favourite. Freddy was brown like Billy's hair, and Freddy was the one on charge. Billy liked the idea of being in charge. He liked the idea of being an animatronic too. Animatronics were robots. They were strong, and he knew they didn't feel bad things like real people did. It would be nice to not feel bad things. A commercial for Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria came on the screen. It showed one of the real animatronics in the middle of a performance. Billy grabbed the TV remote and jumped to his feet. Pretending the remote was a microphone, he started dancing and singing at the top of his lungs. Billy's mum laughed. She put down her magazine and clapped her hands. Billy's dad lowered his paper and watched Billy perform. I'm an animatronic! Billy shouted. Billy's mum and dad smiled and nodded. Okay, Billy, they said in unison. You're an animatronic. Billy began marching, stiff-legged, around the living room. He stomped hard as he walked, rattling the lamps on the end tables and all his mom's knickknacks. I love this story already just because of how innocent and amazing Billy is as a character. It's so cute, oh my gosh. Billy plodded over to the entryway, right off the living room. He yanked coats off the coat rack and grabbed the rack, pretending it was a microphone stand. Pulling the stand over, he bent at the waist and sang into it. On the TV, the show returned to the screen. Billy dropped the coat rack and trudged back over to the coffee table, pretending to be like Freddy the whole time. He sat back down on the floor again, but he did it as if his arms and legs were made of metal like the animatronics' arms and legs. He put his legs straight out in front of him instead of crossing them. He liked how it felt to move like that. It made him feel big and powerful. It made him feel like nothing could hurt him. <laughs> the next morning, Billy stomped down the stairs to the kitchen. He was still being an animatronic. He liked being an animatronic. Keeping his back very straight, Billy sat at the round table in his mum's yellow and white kitchen. Morning sun peeked past girly flowered curtains covering the big windows of the table. Billy, look, uh, Billy looked outside. In a loud voice as robotic as he could make it, he said, It is a pretty day. I want to go to the park after school. Billy's dad walked into the room. Why are you shouting? He asked Billy. I am not shouting, Billy said loudly. I am a robot, and this is how I talk. Oh, Billy's dad said. Okay. Billy saw his dad raise his eyebrow at his mum. He, she made a fluttery gesture with her hand. Billy's dad sighed. Taking the chair next to Billy's, Billy's dad accepted the cup of coffee in Billy's mum... Uh, Billy's mum handed to him. Billy's dad took a sip, then sat up really straight and said, Oh no. Wait, yeah. Oh no, I think my f coffee has fried my circuits. He made a bunch of sputtering noises that sounded like a radio between stations. Bzz, bzz, bzz. He went stiff and then let his head fall forward to the table with a thunk. Billy laughed, a robotic, ha, ha, ha. He poked his dad's shoulder. You need to go to parts and service so you can be repaired, Billy said in his new robot voice. I will save your chair while you are gone. Billy's dad raised his head. That is a good idea, he said in a deep, booming voice. I will go to parts and service. Billy's dad got up and stepped over to Billy's mum. I'll take my coffee to go and pick up something at work, he whispered to her. She nodded and poured his coffee into a travel mug. How long do you think he's going to be an animatronic? Billy's dad asked, still whispering. Billy's mom smiled over at Billy. He gave her a big smile back, exposing his teeth the way animatronics did. He'll get bored with it soon enough, Billy's mom whispered. Billy wondered why they were whispering. He could hear everything they said. Animatronics had very good auditory senses, and they didn't get bored easily. When Billy's mom took him to his kindergarten class after breakfast, Billy marched into the bright, colourful room filled with playing kids, and he announced, I am an animatronic. He pretended he was made of metal as he walked over to his friends. Two of Billy's friends immediately started acting like robots too. Clark, small and red-headed, made a good robot. He walked with his arms straight out in front of him, and he spoke with a mechanical voice. Peter wasn't as good as being, an, uh, as being a robot, because he moved too fast and bent too much. 
but he, too, did a pretty good robotic voice. Robot will take over the world, he announced. Robots rule, Billy agreed. Billy's friend Sadie didn't like that Billy was a robot. She tossed her black pigtails, put her hands on her hips, and said, You're not a robot, Billy. You're being dumb. Billy stomped over to Sadie and pushed her. I am a robot, and you can not call me dumb. Sadie ran to their teacher, Mrs. Foswick. Mrs. Foswick, who was very tall and had short hair and could have been a good animatronic herself, put Billy in a timeout. It wasn't a real timeout, though, because she didn't turn him off, and as long as an animatronic wasn't turned off, it kept going. So, Billy sat in the corner of the kindergarten classroom, and he sang. No matter what Miss Foswick said to him, he didn't stop singing. Mrs. Foswick got very upset. Billy didn't tell her that all she had to do was switch him off, because he didn't want to be switched off. Billy didn't tell his mum that he could be switched off either, when she came to pick him up early. All he did was stand tall and straight while his mum talked to Mrs. Foswick, and then he left the school with his mum, marching to the family station wagon and getting in the back seat. There, he sat bowled upright, his head swivelling left and right as his visual sensors gathered data about his surroundings and stored it in his processor, which then told him that the sun had gone behind clouds and it was raining. Billy was glad he was inside the car. Rain wasn't good for animatronics. When Billy's mum got behind the wheel of the car, she turned to look at Billy. You made Mrs. Foswick unhappy, she said. Mrs. Foswick does not like singing robots, Billy told her. Billy's mum smiled at Billy. That might be true, but I like singing robots. What do you want to sing on the way home? Billy thought about it. I think we should sing around. He began singing. Row, row, row your boat. As soon as he reached gently down the stream, his mum joined in. Billy thought it was good that his mum liked singing robots. After Billy and his mum went through the song twice, his mum asked, what do singing robots like to eat for lunch? Pizza! Billy boomed. Pizza it is, Billy's mum said. He glanced at Billy in her rearview mirror as she turned the car in the direction of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Now I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to stop right here. This is not the Mega Pizzaplex. This is not a Pizzaplex. This is Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Okay? Take a, take a mental note of that. We are not in the in the Pizzaplex era. era. We are in the Pizzeria era. Um, just one quick thing I do want to say is Billy was watching Freddy and Friends, right? Freddy and Friends on tour, which was like the setup to Security Breach, is actually a an archived TV show. So it was from the past. It wasn't like, it's not like a modern day thing. It was from the past of Freddy's. So that's something good to note. This all takes place probably a lot, uh, a lot more in the past from Security Breach rather than the future or present. Billy's circuits returned to processing his surroundings. They took note of the passing cars, the birds hopping around under bushes near the roads, and the rows of houses along the sidewalk. They filed everything in Billy's memory banks, so that when Billy's dad came home from work that night, Billy was able to recite that afternoon's events perfectly. At first, Billy's dad seemed surprised by the list of things Billy's processes recorded that day, but then he smiled and said, well, let's see what my processors recorded today. He then listed all the things he had seen since he left the house that morning. It turned out he didn't he hadn't seen much. Billy's dad spent the day in his small office. It didn't take him long to list his desk, his shelves, his computer, and his window looking out at a parking lot, and the pictures of Billy and Billy's mum that hang on the wall that hung on the wall. When Billy's mum put salad and chicken on the table in front of Billy and his dad, Billy said, Robots do not eat salad. Some do, Billy's dad said. It depends on their settings. Billy's dad reached out and turned a switch under Billy's ear. There, now you're a robot that eats salads. <laughs> Billy checked with his internal systems to see if this was true. Apparently it was, but his systems didn't say Billy had to like the salad. So he ate it, and he didn't like it. The next day, Mrs. Foswick was much nicer to Billy. When he stomped into the classroom, Mrs. Foswick rushed up to Billy and said, Hi, Billy, come with me. Mrs. Foswick took Billy's hand. He let her close her fingers over his stiff ones. Bending his arm only slightly, 
He walked with her, lifting his feet and bringing them down hard on the room's purple and blue rubber flooring. I made a special place for you, Mrs. Foswick said. It's a place just for animatronics. Mrs. Foswick led Billy to the back of the classroom, and she sat him at the desk. A big cardboard sign on the desk had a drawing of a robot connected by a cord to a chair. Under the drawing, big black letters stretched across the sign. Do you know what letter that is? Mrs. Foswick asked Billy, pointing at the first one. Billy recognised it. That is an A, Billy said. That's right, Mrs. Foswick said. What a smart robot you are. Mrs. Foswick motioned to her teacher's assistant, Mrs. Harper. She was the opposite of Mrs. Foswick. Miss Harper was short and had long hair that she wore in a ponytail. She was very nice. Miss Harper came over and smiled at Billy. She pulled up a chair and sat next to him. Miss Harper is going to, um, program your circuits with more letters so you can read the sign by the end of the day, Mrs. Foswick said. Does that sound good, Billy? Billy nodded stiffly several times. It was good for animatronics to learn new things. Billy started singing about learning new things. He sang everything that Miss Harper taught him. While Miss Harper taught Billy, the other kids learned and played like normal. Billy's friends, Clark and Peter, had stopped being animatronics. Instead, they'd started laughing at Billy. So had the other kids. They said it was stupid that he was still acting like a robot. Billy didn't care about what the other kids said, because animatronics didn't care about things like that. He ignored the other kids, and he put his attention only on Miss Harper and what she was uploading to his databanks. By the end of the day, Billy knew what the word animatronics looked like in letters, and he knew the sign on the desk said animatronic charging station. This will be your place in this classroom for as long as you're an animatronic, Miss Harper told Billy. I'll always be an animatronic, Billy sang. <laughs> I don't know how else to sing, to sing that. <laughs> um... That, that night, Billy lay on his back in bed. He refused his mum's offer to curl up with Max. First, animatronics didn't curl up. Second, they didn't have stuffed teddy bears named Max. Billy lay straight and stiff, his arms at his sides. Animatronics didn't sleep either, but they could act like humans. Billy closed his eyes. He knew that, soon, he would be turned off so his circuits could reboot. His mum bent over and kissed his forehead. She sighed. Good night, Billy. She said. Good night, Mum, Billy said. Billy listened to his mum's footsteps shuffle across the thick red carpet. Even though, even through his closed eyes, his visual senses picked up on the room's light going out. Then his auditory senses zeroed in on his mum's voice. She was standing in his bedroom doorway. I'm not sure what else we can do at this point, she whispered. I talked to Miss Foswick, and she agreed to play along. She assigned Miss Harper to work with Billy separately from the other kids. This is going on for too long, Billy's dad said. It's only been a couple days, Billy's mum responded. Let's give it some time. You'll get tired of it soon. Billy's processors tried to compute what he might get tired of. He was experiencing being tired in general right now. His programming was very good. He knew he should be tired when he had to go to bed. He was a very good animatronic. As he listened to his parents talking, Billy's programming began to update. The update was a download of information related to being a little boy. Billy was an animatronic, yes, but he was an animatronic designed to be his parents' son. To be his parents' son, he had to act like a small child who went to kindergarten and played games. Billy wasn't just a good animatronic, he was also a top-of-the-line animatronic. This meant he could perform any tasks set by his programming. He could act like a child and play games. He could do it well. The next morning, Billy stiffly began following his new programming. Although he was still limited by his metal limbs and he could only speak in whole words because that was what his voice box allowed, he started being his parents' son and being a little kid in kindergarten instead of being a singing robot. This new version of Billy, the animatronic, seemed to make everyone a little happier. Although Billy's friends still made fun of him, Mrs. Foswick, Miss Harper, and Billy's parents seemed pleased with the improved version of the Billy animatronic, at least for a while. As an animatronic, Billy wasn't aware of the passage of time. He didn't keep track of days and weeks and months. He did note, however, when his mum stopped talking to him, or stopped taking him to the kindergarten classroom. Have my operating specs changed again? 
Billy asks the first morning. His mum didn't put him in the car to take him to, to school. Billy's mum, who was making pancakes, turned and frowned at Billy. What? You did not take me to school, Billy said. Billy's mum frowned again. Then she quickly replaced the frown with a smile. Sometimes her expressions would change fast like that, and Billy would wonder if his mum was an animatronic too. School's out for the summer, Billy, his mum said. Billy ran through his circuits. He discovers his programming needed another update. What does bi a Billy animatronic do when it is not in school? Billy asked. Fun things, his mum answered. I will need you to input a list of those things so I can operate right, Billy told her. His mum put a pl plate of pancakes in front of Billy. Start with eating pancakes. That's fun. Billy lifted his fork and cut into the pancakes. He acted like it was fun. Uh, Vera pulled on her green cotton nightshirt and watched her husband, wearing a fav his favourite baggy PJs, pull back the covers and get into their king-size bed. He switched on the brass lamp that sat on the nightstand. Dan looked at Vera. We have to do something about Billy. Vera turned back the covers on her side of the bed. She got under the sheets and leaned up against her plumped up pillows. She didn't answer back Dan at first. She just surveyed their lovely bedroom. Decorated in neutral beige and brown tones, their bedroom was a calm oasis from the stresses of daily lives. Ev uh, she decorated the room herself and she took pride in how comfortable and soothing it was. It wasn't soothing her tonight though. I know we have to do something, Vera finally said. Oh, how she knew. It had been a little over six months since her sweet little boy had stopped being her sweet little boy and instead had started acting like an animatronic. Dan picked up the TV remote, but he didn't turn on the TV. If I'd known that that show would have had this effect on him, Dan said, I'd never have allowed him to watch it. How are we supposed to know? Vera asked. It's just a silly little show. I have half a mind to sue Fastbro Entertainment, Dan said. Yeah, Dan, bro, you're not going to be able to do anything against Fastbro Entertainment, mate. <laughs> Vera turned and glared at Dan. And how would that help Billy, she asked. Doesn't matter who's responsible. What matters is taking care of him. Why can't he like sports like a normal little boy? Dan asked. Vera slapped his arm. Every child is different. I keep telling you that. Not all boys like sports. Dan sighed. He toyed with the remote. And you're still sure that going along with all this is the right idea? Dan asked. Vera shrugged. I called Dr. Lingstrom this morning after Billy asked me to input a list of fun things. I'm not sure I have much faith in Dr. Lingstrom, Dan said. She's been seeing Billy for four months and it's not helping. I don't think child psychology is a precise science, Vera said. But she assured me again that this kind of make-believe is perfectly natural for a kid Billy's age. I bet she's never heard of a kid walking and talking like a robot all the time for over six months, Dan protested. Vera chewed on her lower lip. Well, no. But she said she did treat a kid who pretended to be an alien for over a year. Why did he stop? Dr. Lingstrom wasn't sure. He just started acting normally again one day. Vera reached out for a tube of lotion. She slathered some on her hands, inhaling the lotion's soothing lavender fragrance. In the last few months, Vera had done a lot of research on how to ease anxiety. Lavender was supposed to be relaxing. She now used lavender-scented shampoo, conditioner and lotion, and she'd put lavender sachets in every drawer and closet in their bedroom. Dan had started complaining about it. Apparently his clothes smelled so much like lavender that his co-workers had started teasing him about it. I wish Billy would go back to normal, Dan said. Me too, Vera said. Billy found he was very good at meeting the fun protocol of his new programming. It mostly required him to play with toys in his yard and sit in front of the TV. It also included going to the park, eating ice cream, and playing games with his mum. It didn't, Billy noticed, involve spending time with friends. Billy didn't have friends anymore. Apparently, other kids didn't like animatronics. In addition to his fun tasks, Billy was required to visit Dr. Lingstrom. This had been something he was expected to do for several months. It had started while he was still being Billy in kindergarten. 
Dr. Lingstrom, Billy Stancers told him, was a young woman with big glasses and a bun on the top of her head. Billy always saw her in pale blue office, in a pale blue office that held a desk and a play area filled with blocks and dolls. Dr. Lingstrom had Billy sit in the play area and she told him to play with the blocks and dolls. Billy, already programmed for fun, didn't have trouble with the play. He only had trouble when Dr. Lingstrom asked questions like, why do you think you're an animatronic? And do you remember being just a little boy? These questions were very challenging for Billy's chips to process. They made no sense. Billy always answered the questions the same. I think I am an animatronic because I am an animatronic, Billy said. I have never... S I... No, never mind. Sorry. I have never been just a little boy. I am programmed to act like one and I do that. Dr. Lingstrom asked Billy a lot of questions that required him to access his memory banks. He answered them all. He had a lot of images and information in his memory banks. Nothing Billy said, though, seemed to make Dr. Lingstrom happy. Billy had trouble making sense of these visits with the serious woman. They were not consistent with his function of fun. The two things didn't seem to go together. Mostly, though, Billy's fun programming was effective. One day, though, the fun protocol ended. Billy's mom took him to another classroom. This was first grade she said, and it was in a new school, a private school. None of Billy's old friends were in his school, his mum said. She said she, she said he could make new friends. Billy thought she was wrong. He didn't think the kids would like animatronics any more than his old friends did. When Billy's mum told him about the new school, Billy told her he needed a new download. What tasks would he be expected to perform? She told him to go to the classroom and learn. On the first day of first grade, Billy's new teacher, a curly-haired woman named Mrs. Cromwell, asked the children to stand up and introduce themselves. Tell us your name and what you like to do, she said. Billy's auditory systems processed as three children stood and did as they'd been instructed. I'm Ellie, a little blonde girl said. I like to dance. I'm Vic, a dark-skinned boy said. I like baseball. I'm Terry, a short boy said. I play chess. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Cromwell pointed at Billy. Billy unfolded his metal limbs. He stood bolt upright, his arms straight at the sides. I am an animatronic named Billy, he said. I like doing what I am programmed to do. The other kids in the room started laughing. Mrs. Cromwell stood. Shush, everyone hush, be nice. The laughter died down to a few giggles and snorts. Billy was not bothered by the sounds. He was an animatronic. He didn't have feelings. Nothing bothered him. According to Billy's mom, the new private school had a lot of classes that normal schools didn't have. Billy's mom told him this when she was updating his servers before he went to bed. She called this process tucking him in. It was the time uh, when she gave him the information that he required to do what he needed to do the next day. They even have a beginning robotics class for first graders, Billy's mom said. You'll learn how robots work. Billy knew how robots worked. He was a robot. He knew how he worked. The next day, however, Billy discovered that the class did teach him something. Robots, he learned, needed a special oil to lubricate their joints. Billy had never been oiled. He filed away the information in his data banks. He would do something about it when he was, he, when he was returned home from school. For a period of time, Billy wasn't sure how long a time Billy followed the protocol for a well-oiled robot. He found the necessary oil in the garage on his, dad, on his dad's workbench. The oil was clear and thick. It didn't register as pleasant to Billy's taste senses, and it gave him sensations that were not his usual state. Aches in, the, in his middle and in his head but he didn't let that keep him from properly caring for his parts. At meals, Billy ate less and less food. In the garage, he took in more and more oil. One day, though, Billy's systems malfunctioned. When he tried to raise himself out of bed in the morning, he immediately registered that something was wrong. In his animatronic belly, pressing pain like sensory input con constricted Billy's internal parts. Aware that small beads of water had appeared on his forehead, Billy had to concentrate to get his mechanical body to make the trek from his room to the kitchen. 
instead of feeling strong like he usually did, he felt like he was going to fall over. He almost didn't make it to his chair in the kitchen. Concentrating on putting eggs and sausage on a plate, Billy's mom didn't notice that he was malfunctioning. She didn't notice, that is, until after Billy had consumed, as he'd been programmed to, the entire plateful of eggs and sausage. It was at that point that the smell of the sausage glitched up Billy's olfactory sensors, causing the sensors to trigger a cascade of system failures. Fail, eh, failures sorry. Billy's stomach parts and his throat parts crashed together, and the eggs and sausage came back up. They erupted from his open mouth and splashed all over the floor. That day, Billy's mom took him to parts and service, although she called parts and service the hospital. Billy's memory banks brought up images of him being in the hospital when he was three, but the images did not have any negative impact on him. He was a robot, so he couldn't be upset by anything. Parts and service was just another place to be. It was neither good nor bad. Therefore, animatronic Billy was calm while he was given a complete system-wide check. The check determined that he was temporarily out of service, what his mom called sick. Billy didn't have to stay in parts and service for long though. When he came home, he reasoned that he was fully reconfigured. He returned to his self-oiling routine. He thought it was a good routine. Maybe it wasn't though. He was back in parts and service again the next day. In parts and service, a round-bellied, bald-headed animatronic repair person, called Dr. Reynolds, was able to detect the oil that Billy had been using. This oil, Dr. Reynolds said, was a very bad idea. But I am an animatronic, Billy objected. I must keep my joints lubricated. Dr. Reynolds had a conference with Billy's mom while Billy lay flat on his back in a bed with metal railings on the side. He lay there and looked up at the white ceiling. Dr. Reynolds and Billy's mom whispered, but Billy could hear every word. He's in Dr. Lingstrom's care, Billy's mom told Dr. Reynolds. And what does she say? Dr. Reynolds asked. She says we should play along with his fantasy. If we don't, it could cause a psychotic break. Billy ran the words psychotic break through his databases. He had no information about the word psychotic, but break had many meanings. He suspected that some of his systems were damaged in some way. This did not concern him. He trusted that Dr. Reynolds would repair them. A psychotic break will be the least of your problems if he keeps ingesting oil, Dr. Reynolds said. Well then, Billy's mom said, you need to tell him there's another way to oil his joints. Dr. Reynolds and Billy's mom stopped talking. They walked over to the bed. Sit up, Billy, Dr. Reynolds instructed. Billy sat up. You want to keep your systems in good shape, don't you? Dr. Reynolds said. Good animatronics self-regulate, Billy said. Dr. Reynolds nodded. Then I need to add some important information to your database. Are you ready for inputting? Billy nodded. He directed his unblinking gaze at Dr. Reynolds. The best oil for your particular kind of animatronic joints, Dr. Reynolds said, is olive oil. <laughs> oh, it's something that your mum can put in your food. And if you eat the food she cooks, your joints will function perfectly. Oh, okay. For a minute, I thought you were saying just... Drink olive oil, mate, and you'll be okay. You'll be better. Billy looked from his mum to Dr. Reynolds and back again. He concentrated on letting the information process. In spite of the whispered conversation that he'd heard, which was something his processor couldn't quite compute, this new data was consistent with Billy's goal of being the best animatronic he could be. Because of this, Billy nodded once. I will comply. Billy remained in parts and service for another day. Then his mum brought him home. He returned to being a good animatronic. Although Billy wasn't able to keep track of time very well, he learned that certain days came just once a year. So when these days came around, he knew a year had gone by. Christmas was one of these special days. Billy had a whole set of operating protocols for Christmas. They were protocols similar to summer fun protocols, but they were more specific. At Christmas time, Billy was required to help his parents hang strings of white lights on the trees outside, and help put bright hanging things on a tree that was brought inside. Billy was also required to unwrap brightly wrapped boxes that were put under the tree. This was a simple task. He opened the boxes, looked at what was inside, said, thank you, then put the <laughs> object aside before opening the next box. Animatronic Billy had four of these 
tree-centred days in his memory banks before an event occurred that required him to establish some new neural networks. The event was preceded by a conversation that his auditory senses recorded as he was passing his parents' closed bedroom door on the way to the bathroom. Although animatronics generally had no need to pee or do any of the other things done in bathrooms, Billy was nothing if not fully devoted to his child protocol. He was, he believed, a most rare animatronic in that he developed the ability to pee and brush his teeth and bathe like a normal child. The fact that all the water involved in bathing didn't short out his circuits or rust his metal endoskeleton was a testament to the effectiveness of ingesting his mum's oil olive oil. <laughs> oh, Billy. I love it. I love how this story has a lot to do with, like, innocent logic. Uh, innocent logic in a child and kind of innocent logic in a robot as well. Like, you... You don't really get that anywhere else. Anyway, Billy usually didn't allow his parents' conversations to use up his RAM. But the, ra <laughs> but the night he was heading to the bathroom, he felt compelled, for reasons he didn't understand, to stop and listen. Perhaps it was the word institution that had triggered his attention. This was a word unfamiliar to him. Billy was, however, an animatronic with exceptional artificial intelligence. He could learn. And one of the things he'd learned was that he often that he could often add to his knowledge base by placing new words or experiences in the context of their surroundings. To that end, he listened to his mum and dad talk so he could discern the meaning of institution. I'm not putting him in an institution, Billy's mum hissed right after Billy's dad spoke. He's my son. After everything he went through when he was three, when we had to leave him in intensive care. No, I'm not leaving him anywhere again. He's staying home with me. At what cost, Vera? Or Vera, sorry. I, I'm i always like, yeah. Uh, you've been going along with this insane fantasy for over four years. Four years! It just can't go on. I think he'll give up soon. Something thudded against the door. Billy's auditory processors told him a shoe had just hit the wood. We don't know that! Billy's dad shouted. Shh! Billy's mum said. He'll hear you. I don't care if he hears me, Billy's dad yelled. I don't care about anything anymore. I can't take it, Vera. I can't. We have a freak for a son, and we have no life. We can't go anywhere or do anything with him. All we can do is sit at home and watch our little boy pretend to be a robot. That's not living. That's hell. Footsteps stomped across the floor behind the door. Billy strode as quickly as his rigid legs allowed into the bathroom. There, he closed the door. He heard his parents' door open, more thudding footsteps, then silence. Billy sat on the closed toilet seat and worked through what he heard. His dad, it seemed, didn't like animatronics anymore. Oh well, that was okay. Billy didn't need his dad to like him. Billy was still a very good animatronic, whether his dad liked him or not. Billy's dad left two days after the conversation Billy heard. He left, and he didn't come back. Why did dad leave? Billy asked as he watched his mum sauté mushrooms and onions in olive oil. She was making spaghetti sauce. This was a red sauce that Billy thought resembled human blood. He wasn't convinced that eating it was appropriate, but he had no data with which to reach a definite conclusion. Billy's mum, who had been crying off and on throughout the day, wiped a hand across her eyes. She stopped sautéing and came over to the table to sit with Billy. She took Billy's hand. Billy, as a robot, had no need for physical touch. However, he found that the feel of his mum's hand was agreeable to his tactile senses. Therefore, he sat stiffly and let her hold his hand. Your dad doesn't understand, Billy, Billy's mum said. He thinks you can make yourself be something besides who you are. Billy cocked his head, running this through his programming. It is not possible for a thing to be not the thing it is, he said. The thing is the thing. Billy's mum made a sharp laughing sound. One laugh. It was like the bark of a big sea lion. Billy had seen sea lions on TV. They were part of his animal database, which was quite large. Billy's mum stood. She patted Billy on the top of his head. Spoken like a wise little animatronic, she said. I am not as little as I was before, Billy said. He saw himself in the mirror every day. He was much bigger than he used to be. He thought he looked even more like his dad now than he used to, but that didn't matter anymore. His dad was gone. Billy just looked like himself, like Billy, the animatronic. That's true, Billy's mum said, 
and you'll keep getting bigger. She started to return to the stove, then turned back to the table. Billy? I am here, Billy answered. Have you ever heard of an animatronic growing before? Billy's mom's eyes were wet and intense. She, start, she stared so hard at Billy that, for a moment, she looked like an animatronic too. Billy ran the question through his processes. The answer came quickly. No, I have not heard of a growing animatronic. Does that bother you? Billy's mum asked. Her eyes shone even brighter. Billy got the idea that his mum wanted him to say something specific. He wasn't able to access information that told him what that was. No, Billy said. I am an animatronic. I do not get bothered. And why is it important that there are no other animatronics like me? There are many things that exist that I have never heard of. I am unique. Billy's mum wiped her eyes again. She sighed. Yes, you are, she said. She returned to the stove and added a can of tomatoes to the mushrooms and onions. <laughs> By the time Billy finished what was called sixth grade, he had concluded, based on the totality of his experience observing the humans around him and integrating the information that he read, that he could expand his data banks and upgrade his processes more effectively without the dubious help of teachers and school. Both of these things, he discovered, attempted to place restrictions on how Billy took in the world, and the limitations of the restrictions far outweighed any benefit he received from either teachers or school. Because Billy was an exceptional animatronic, his processes were able to integrate information from multiple sources. One of these sources was books. He was able to upload massive amounts of information from books. This was why, on the first morning of what would have been Billy's seventh grade, he announced to his mom, I will not go to school today. Billy's mom had looked unexpectedly happy about this. She'd rushed over to Billy, where he sat on the edge of his sleeping platform. The year before, he'd requested that his bed be replaced with a steel table. It was a far better recharging platform for an animatronic. Why don't you want to go to school? Billy's mom asked. Are you feeling sick? Billy cocked his head and attempted to work out why the idea of being sick made his mum's eyes light up and her mouth widen into a smile different than the ones he usually saw on her face. Billy's processes informed him that his mum's in expression indicated happiness. Billy's mum leaned toward him and looked intently into his eyes. What are you feeling, Billy? she asked. I do not feel, Billy answered. I am an animatronic. Billy's mum's smile disappeared. Her eyes moistened and she rubbed them. Her shoulders slumped. I will not go to school, Billy told his mum, because the disadvantages of school outweigh the advantages. I will add to my databases by reading books. All I will require from you are the rides to the library to acquire the books necessary for my continued learning. <laughs> Billy's mum gazed at Billy for a long time. He gazed back at her. His visual senses processed what he saw. Billy had noted that as he got bigger and his face looked more like that of his now absent dad, his mum got smaller, more accurately narrower, and her face looked less like her face. Billy had in his memory banks the image of his mum's round and smooth face, her bright blue eyes, and her shiny and bouncy blonde hair. The round face, however, was no longer round. It was more oblong, and it revealed the bone structure under his mum's skin. The skin itself didn't seem to fit the bones. It sagged, folding into little pleats between her eyes, around her mouth, and at her jawline. The skin was a different colour too. Before, the skin had been pinkish. Now it looked kind of grey. Billy's mum's eyes and hair were different too. Her eyes had lost some of their colour. They were now a faded blue. And her hair had no shine. It didn't bounce either. It hung limply like the kind of hair Billy had seen on a rag doll. The little girl who lived next door had a rag doll. That little girl didn't like Billy. She once screamed at him that if he got close to her, she'd have her doll eat him up. <laughs> Billy was unable to process this. From what he knew of dolls, one could not consume him. Billy's mom interrupted his internal processing. She patted his thigh and stood. I'll get your breakfast, she said. After breakfast, Billy's mom took him to the library. There, he checked out a stack of eight books. This was the largest number of books he was allowed to take out at one time. I will be back in two days, Billy informed the large grey-haired librarian when she pushed the stack of books across the counter to him. The woman nodded several times, then she ran to the other end of the counter. Billy determined that something had made her nervous. 
he didn't know what that was. Billy spent the rest of the first day of no school sitting in the chair at his desk. He read all day until his processors informed him it was time for dinner. When he received that cue, Billy stood and left his room. He started down the hall, heading toward the kitchen. As Billy walked in his usual stiff-armed and stiff-legged way, he accessed a memory of how he had walked when he'd first become an animatronic. He had strode with too much force, so that every step he took stumped on the ground and rattled everything in the room he was in. It was Dr Lingstrom who had updated Billy's systems, programming him for a quieter way of getting around. You see, she told him when, he, when she'd demonstrated the new way he was to move. You can move your metal arms and legs without putting your feet down with so much force. She walked across the room using a ga gait similar to Billy's. Billy noticed how she placed her feet so that her footfalls were, silence, uh, were silent and didn't make anything shake. Billy had mimicked Dick, Dr. Lingstrom and found the result satisfactory. He had walked quietly ever since. So now Billy approached the kitchen silently. He could hear hit, hit, ah, sorry. He could hear his mom moving around in the small room, but she couldn't hear him. As Billy got to the doorway before he stepped into his mom's view, he discerned what she was talking because he knew no one was in the house beside him and his mom. Billy deduced she was talking on the phone. Billy liked the phone. He had discovered that communicating via the phone was usually more effective. That is a spelling mistake. That should be an E instead of an A. Um, it did away with the complexity of processing multiple sensory cues at once. The phone required only auditory processing. Because listening to his mom's phone's conversations often resulted in updating Billy's systems, she said things to other people that she didn't say to him, he stopped just outside the doorway to the kitchen. He focused on his mom's words. I just don't know what to do now. Billy's mum said, you told me not to force him into anything, so I didn't make him go to school. But without other kids to emulate, how will he learn to be a normal boy? Billy ran this question through his neural networks. Did it mean that he was not effectively performing his function as his mum's son? Billy listened more. Perhaps the conversation would give him more information to add to his systems. No, 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 I'm not. I, I told you I'm not pinning him someplace. You said... As long as he wasn't a danger to himself or anyone else, I could keep him at home. Billy knew he was not dangerous to anyone. Although robots could be programmed to be destructive, Billy wasn't one of those. He was designed to value human life. Yes, I, I can take care of him, his mum said. He's my son. You know, I work from home so I can be here from him every day. I'll do whatever he needs. Working from home was a concept Billy understood. His mum had inputted all the necessary information about that. She was, she told him, a financial advisor and investor. She managed people's money, and she also invested her own money. She did this on her computer in the office next to her bedroom. After his mom introduced Billy to the concept of investing, he checked out books on the subject. The librarian had told him the books were too old for him. This was not something Billy could process, so he ignored it. He read the books. He wasn't able to integrate all the information to his systems, but he stored much of it, and he continued to add, that, add to that knowledge base. Every child is different, Billy's mum was saying into the phone now. Billy is Billy. I'm not going to force him to see himself differently than he does, even if what he sees isn't normal. Billy was an animatronic, so he didn't feel. But when his mum spoke, he experienced a sensation that might have been similar to an emotion. He felt an unusual warmth in the area of his heart. His processes prompted him to step into the kitchen and approach his mum. When Billy's mum saw Billy, she quickly said goodbye and hung up the phone. Billy walked over to her and rigidly encircled her stick-like shoulders with his own strong arms. Billy's mum widened her eyes at him. Then she put her arms around him and she cried.